Okay. So I should just leave that on. Probably just, Pretty much, yeah. But not now because people don't want to hear the small talk. Oh.
The applause is so far undeserved. Thanks for the kind introduction, Jason. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. It's a pretty distinguished cast in this series, and um, I'm probably going to cross things up a little bit by, to an extent, telling my life story. And uh, I don't know that that's exactly what Jason had in mind when um, we started this. I'm hoping to be pushing the right buttons here. But um, my wife, Carol, and I, Carol's back there and has been uh, you know, a wonderful life's companion. We just got back from a long bicycle tour and in the south and when we were there was when I was trying to put together what I was going to say. So far from everywhere I decided, you know, it'd be kind of fun to look. I have this life in which I was kind of a, a businessman engineer, but all the while my passion has been creative design and inventions and um, that's been a piece of my life that uh, I haven't ever really focused on looking back at and and uh, seeing whether there's some lessons there and so I wrote up this little synopsis that uh, some of you may have read and, and as I often do I over promised I over promised particularly in terms of my ability to draw lessons <laughs> because there have been so many experiences and uh, I'm not sure that I really have learned the lessons that I should have over the past 60 years almost at doing creative designs. But anyway, it's, uh, it, it, I've had a lot of fun trying to get ready for this. I had some challenges too because when I look back at my folders and notes, I've got probably 150 concepts that I took far enough to think that they were worth something. And I was maybe right 10% of the time at best, but nonetheless, I put so much effort and passion into these things that when I go back to look at them, it's really hard to choose which of these babies I should focus on for a, an exercise like this. But the focus here is going to be on um, inventions and um, you know what are some of the ways that you can increase your chances of being successful in creative design. Um, just to finish out this slide, and I'm going to have to move fast because every time I've gone through this, I, I start to run out of time at the end. So uh, I'm not going to deal much with these, the last two bullets on this slide. But one thing I've sure noticed is, like everything in our society, um, the pace is accelerating. My first patent I obtained, I think I applied for it in 1970 and it issued in 1973. And the number was about 3,700,000 something. And my last one was 9.2 million, and I think the latest ones that are issuing now are more than 9.5 million. So Patent Office uh, started business in 1790, first 180 plus years, 3.5 million, 40 to 45 years since then, almost twice that many. So that's the way things go in our society. So I'm going to, uh, the little, uh, little graphic up there doesn't emphasize the life, but this is uh, sort of my life story as an inventor, as I said. And mo I, I did some creative design work before I went off to Stanford as a grad student in 1967, but I, with advice from my advisor from West Virginia University, where I got my um, bachelor's in ME, and I, I previously had a, a BA degree from Amherst College, so I'd done a lot of writing, and that kind of influenced the way Stanford used me. <laughs> but um, I enrolled in the design division because my uh, sponsor from West Virginia had been out to Stanford for a summer program and really enjoyed it and thought it would be perfect for me. So when I got there in the summer of 67, um, immediately I was in a, uh, I was part of a student team, one of about seven or eight teams, together with one faculty team, and we were and the faculty members had come from elsewhere too, and we each had a charge to develop a design of something unique as far as we could take it. 
And I won't tell you about ours, but it was something we had fun with. But the faculty team uh, designed and built this thing that they called the Moto Hoop. And it was a one-wheeled vehicle that um, I'll show you. I, I, my first patent was on a, a, an embellishment of that. And I'll show you that in a little bit. But I got to be, it, it became interesting to the TV stations and so after the professors left they perfected it by adding a gas motor because it didn't work with the electric motor that they had built it with <laughs> and I got to be the test pilot so I got I got filmed driving this thing which wasn't easy because it didn't steer well around uh, one of those big fields along El Camino in Palo Alto and as it was as I was riding this thing it, it had the, this series of outriggers that supported two outer rings uh, from the main center ring that was the largest diameter thing. And every time one of those outriggers went by, it hammered my elbow. <laughs> I, have, I have bone chips on my elbow to this day, but I was holding the camera, so I couldn't let go of that, you know. And uh, so I have, you know, I have a, a reminder of that, um, especially when it's, when it's humid and damp. Um, so anyway, I also got to be an engineering case writer, and my advisor, uh, uh, Henry Fuchs had started an engineering case library. I don't know if UC Davis has one of these yet, but I got to write up uh, several cases. And this was, so they were, in engineering school, they were using cases in the same way that law schools and, and uh, business schools use them to, you know, equip uh, grads to deal with real life situations and have had some prior experience with them. So this one was uh, development of a circular door strike, uh, door strike, uh, which was uh, developed by the, Sch the Schlag Schlag, as we pronounce it, lock company. And I got to work on the uh, case study for the Wright brothers, which was a pretty interesting one. By that time, I think there were about 25 cases in the, in the Stanford case library. And I got to work on an invention that um, the department helped me uh, present to a major corporation who was pretty interested in it. They were trying to figure out how to, how to better sort uh, the, the dark rice grains that they wanted to, uh, you know, separate from the white grains rapidly. And anyway, so they didn't wind up buying it, but it was, I, I still think it was a better way than what. But this is a problem I've had in my life. Usually when I see some, another design, my ego, my design ego is so strong that I think I can always do something better. And, uh, you know, that's a danger. Uh, it, it, it's kind of a, an illness that you, that you get if you do a lot of designing is coming up with the conviction that you can always do something better than, than what's done. Dangerous. Um, anyway, then from there, I'm going to go through a couple of these technologies, uh, starting with, with uh, my steerable one-wheel vehicle and then uh, going to what I think really is my most valuable invention of all time that hasn't ever made it into the marketplace. Um, then talk, in the 80s, Carol and I developed a little business together while I was uh, working hard at getting Davis Energy Group going. I'll show you a little bit about that. Um, and then several other inventions since, some more successful than others. But I'm going to try to draw lessons, and uh, that's, as I said, the hard part. So a steerable one-wheel vehicle, my first patent issued in 73. I actually built uh, a couple versions of this. Uh, I say weak rationale. I promised that I would um, try to uh, draw lessons and and so on and um, probably the lesson from this one is too frivolous but I had seen one work and had fun uh, being involved with that and I thought I could do one better so here's what it is I mean this is a about a five foot diameter uh, wheel and uh, hoop let's call it and that's why the motor hoop and there's an inner carriage that rides on the inside of the outer hoop and when this motor See if I can actually work this pointer now. When that motor drives the inner carriage up the inside of the outer wheel, you get the center of gravity forward of the point of contact with the ground, and the thing starts to move. And as long as you have that center of gravity in front, um, or even, you'll keep moving. And further in front, the more acceleration, etc. Think about braking a little bit. That can be challenging, but it can be um, stopped. Um, not its strong suit, though, but um, I did work out a way to do that. But what my patent was on was the way this seat, which is sort of a third component, you've got the inner carriage that's riding around the inside of the hoop on a nice uh, 
uh, bushing system and, and bushings with bearings. And then you've got this seat which is suspended from the inner uh, carriage right up here. And you can swing that seat from side to side and steer the thing that way. So if you want to go left, you swing yourself out to the left. And if you want to go right, uh, the other way. And um, it, it actually works. Um, and I, you know, I had a considerable rationale in my mind for why this could be a success. There was a lot of interest in those days in off-road vehicles. Things were, this was the, you know, the late 60s, and there were all kinds of uh, OTVs coming out at that point. And this big wheel can go over lots of obstacles. So that was, that was one of the um, perceived benefits. Also, safety advantage in that you're protected inside this this wheel, which is pretty pretty strong. Um, so, you know, I built a couple of these, tested them, and then decided that I really didn't want to be working on motorized vehicles that can go off in the wilds anyway. I don't like the whole concept, but it was fun working on it. I also developed but didn't patent a wheelbarrow that kind of works the same way, where uh, it's one big wheel, the weight's in the center of it, so you don't support the weight as you're moving it, and for dumping, it's pretty easy. Um, you have to kind of swing it so you're not dumping it across the wheel, which would be pretty messy. But I built one of those, tested it, worked. But uh, like uh, so many things, I really didn't uh, get on with it. And one of the problems for me in those days was I uh, was going nuts with a lot of ideas. I, I uh, had a little company called Creative Concepts. I tried to support myself, probably much to Carol's dismay, for a while as a independent inventor. And, and I found my list from 1973 of all the ideas that I was working on simultaneously. And there were 55 of them. And if I read you these titles, you know, the laughs would get louder and louder. And I won't do that. But I sure laughed when I <laughs> looked back at them. So um, I did try to focus on some of the more important ones, though, as I was working. And this is one that I did a lot of work on. And I still believe it would be incredibly valuable. How many of you have ever done electrical work, new electrical work, where you install um, receptacles or switches into wood frame construction? A lot of you have. Well, you know, it's, a, it's at least a three-step process, where first you place, place a box, and then uh, the, the wires get run to the boxes, and then uh, drywall gets put on, and then you come in and you put the receptacle or the switch in, and then after, after painting them, you come in and put cover plates on. And there's a lot of labor there. And the thing that got me excited about this idea when I came up with it was that they're so messy looking generally. Because um, at every stage, there's some adjustment possible. But the guys are moving fast, and they, don't, they aren't very careful with those adjustments. And everything's held together one piece to the next with little screws. So nothing's very tight. So I said, well, why don't we just have one piece receptacles that mount directly to the stud and have everything they need together in one piece, the box, the internal stuff, the, the receptacle, which is partly internal stuff, and the cover plate, and then just run a screw through into the, into the stud. And I, I conjured up this idea that could be, uh, so that's kind of a saddle-shaped thing, you know, that could be mounted either horizontally or vertically to a, to a stud. But anyway, the idea is, it pulls really tight against the stud when you run this, the screw in. And I also worked on a quick strip wiring approach so that you could very quickly make those connections and make them really secure. So I was very enthused about the probable success of this thing. And uh, I, I got two patents on it. In um, 1973, I um, built some models, some pretty nice full-scale models, and I made a sample of a frame box that had some studs in it and showed uh, conventional versus these and putting these in in both a horizontal and a vertical um, uh, orientation. And then I went around and I visited the six major uh, receptacle electrical component manufacturers. And most, they, these were all in the east. Um, and I think maybe there are some out west now, but they were all in the east then. And they all showed quite a bit of interest. And I had nice conversations with a lot of them. And then months went by. And within a two-day period, I got rejection letters from every one of them. <laughs> and I thought, wow, did these guys get together and, and talk about whether it's timely for the industry to have such a radical change in how these are done? And basically, when I got back and talked to the ones I'd like best, they said, well, you know, it's quite a bit of time and money to get this design through UL. And uh, we just don't 
don't see that we want to change the industry that much, so we decided not to pursue this. Um, so none of these ever got installed in the real world. And uh, it, was, it was really, still would be a game-changing technology, but it would take quite an investment to get it through the code processes, and then I think it could be quite successful. But um, I moved on to other things like supporting my family. Um, and meanwhile, Carol and I, uh, when we first moved to Davis, we had a one-year-old, and we had a house that didn't really have room for a high chair. And we'd seen this thing called the sassy seat. Anybody here old enough to remember a sassy seat? It was this little uh, tubular metal and canvas thing that would hang on the edge of a table like, like this does. Um, but it was pretty darn flimsy. It was pretty cheap, too, and it was foldable, so it made it quite transportable. But I decided to make one something like that and make it out of wood. And I'd, I really like this fin ply material, you know, it's hardwood, plywood all the way through. It's a wonderful engineering material, in my opinion. So developed a way with a router to cut these things very efficiently. We developed this little uh, brand and logo. And uh, Carol basically, I had said, I, I don't have time. To, people said, that's pretty cool. Why don't you start a business making those? And I said, I'm working with Davis Energy Group, this consulting company. I don't have time. And Carol said, I can do that. She was three, had three kids at home. And by God, she did. And uh, so we kind of developed the design together, and um, it's, all, it's convertible, so that it can also work as a swing. Uh, whoops, I went the wrong way. Sorry about that. Um, so if you look at the picture at the upper right, that's how it works vertically. The child sits in it the other way. The support strap um, still keeps the, keeps the child from sliding out, and you, there's some hooks on the top that you can hang that from and use it as a swing, and uh, Carol sold about 6,000 of these by, by uh, 1989 or so. We got a patent on it. We also developed a much more complicated convertible piece of furniture that I spent hours and hours on, and we had uh, fun designing that too. And then Carol also made some puzzles, so Perchworks was a pretty going concern for a while. Um, this design was so much appreciated uh, by the Milwaukee Art Museum that they selected, gave it an award and selected it to, for a chair museum in, in, in Milwaukee at one point. And uh, this is a very old one that I'm taking pictures of. We, we had one in storage, but when they're brand new, they were pretty nice looking. And you can see from that one picture how I designed it so that the, those side pieces, which look complicated, nested in such a way that from the one by five strips that we of plywood that we cut these from, there was very, very little waste. So anyway, we had a lot of fun with it. The, the whole concept, though, I think the lawyers got into the act and the whole concept of using uh, a seat that hangs on the edge of a table uh, became quite a liability. And uh, we didn't have any, any issues with that from perches, but it, ultimately Carol decided with the kids much bigger that she was going to go back to work as a nurse. And so Perchworks just kind of died. And, um, you know, I guess I keep thinking in the aftermath that if the Internet had been around, one of the things was, you know, it was a little frustrating because they would get sold to gift shops that sold them for twice what uh, we sold, what they bought them from us for. But today, you could sell these on the Internet, and uh, the, the margins would be much greater, and it would be a more exciting business. Or maybe the prices would be lower, and then the volume would be higher one way or the other. Um, okay, so... Is that really? Yeah, okay. So the next thing I'm moving to is uh, uh, started up really in the, around 1985 or 1986. And uh, let me show you how all the fluids flow through these pipes. I'm not going to do that. <laughs> this, is a, this is, though, an article from Popular Science. This uh, design was uh, selected as one of the top 100 designs of 1991 and featured in Popular Science Magazine, and the, the idea was that you package the heating, uh, cooling, and domestic water heating system for a residence or a small commercial business in one big rectangular solid. And uh, not only do you package all that stuff together uh, for the convenience of it, but you add thermal storage because what the utilities, electric utilities, really needed at that point was a way to keep the cooling loads from uh, dominating their generation requirements. Uh, in, in dry climates, the cooling loads are always the drivers for the, the peak electrical loads. So anything you can do to get cooling loads off peak is quite beneficial. 
Um, so this made ice at night in the summertime, and then the next day the ice was melted as uh, water was pumped through this unit to an indoor uh, heat exchanger, which, which could be either a, a fan coil or a radiant ceiling or floor to cool the indoors. And then in the summertime, when it was um, when it was cooling, it used the discharge heat from that cycle to make hot water, and the rest of the time it used a desuperheater function so that it made hot water very efficiently. So that's the device, and um, SMUD really got behind this technology. Uh, it, it was, by the way, it started because a company came to us, they were working on a different way to do a combined function device like this, and um, I'd been working for a while with a guy who was an employee of ours at Davis Energy Group by then on this better idea. And so we recommended this to them, made a presentation. They decided, yeah, that is a better way to go. So they funded it pretty much, including the patent work. We got two patents on it. Um, and uh, SMUD offered a big incentive. Uh, PG&E offered an incentive, too, as did uh, Edison, so Cal Edison for a while. And about 600 of them were installed in new homes by 1991. But it kind of went downhill because the guy running the company kept upping the price and the utilities wanted to keep reducing their incentives thinking as the volume went up the price should be coming down and you know it's just one of those things where maybe if a big company um, one of the oh, this isn't working anymore anyway uh, bottom line if a major HVAC company had gotten interested in it and bought it then maybe it would have gone somewhere but that didn't happen and uh, there was also an interesting performance issue that we ran up against, thanks Jason, in um, Edison territory, which was that down there, there were some uh, winter days when it was warm enough in the afternoons that the houses, which weren't built as well then, this probably wouldn't happen today, needed heating in the morning and cooling in the afternoon. And when you have a big thermal storage tank like this, you can't afford the energy to swing it back and forth from heating to cooling every day. So that kind of limited the market. Um, another uh, technology that uh, I'm very bullish on, but haven't one that I haven't been very successful in uh, making happen in a big way, I call night roof spray storage cooling. And I got started on this um, when we, uh, back in the mid-70s, a guy named Harold Hay. Anyone ever heard of Harold Hay and the Skytherm house? This is ancient history now, but he uh, developed this concept and had a house built with some support from the Cal Poly folks, I think, that was basically a, a one-story uh, flat roof house, dead level roof, uh, with no insulation between the, uh, the roof structure and the indoors. And on top of that dead level structural roof um, was placed a uh, like a water bed, a huge water bed mattress, something that held four or five inches of water in a single contained layer, fully enclosed. And then above that, there was a system driven by garage door openers of big insulating panels that could be slid back and forth so that in the summer, for example, you would open it at night. And what, you got, anybody here know what's the coldest place in the environment on, on a over a 24-hour period in, in a dry climate. Night, well, I don't have the word sky up there yet. It's the night sky. The night, in, in a clear climate, on a clear night, the night sky will typically fall as a radiative receiver. Some of you have had heat transfer, so you know uh, radiation as a heat transfer mechanism. will drop below freezing as a radiative receiver. So it's a very powerful mechanism to discharge heat from the Earth's surface to the night sky. And the reason that in dry climates like this we have such a large daily temperature swing is that at night the Earth is much more successful at discharging heat to, the, to deep space because of the clear sky and the little bit of humidity involved. Whereas if you're in an eastern, more humid climate, even if it's clear, you can't discharge nearly as much radiation at night because there's more moisture in the air which interferes. So anyway, the concept is radiatively discharged to the, to the night sky, and the Skytherm house did that. Well, I looked at that and said, hmm, you know, 
I see a lot of problems mechanically with that thing operating, and why not take advantage of some evaporative cooling too? So I took that concept, what I thought was one better, by um, on the roof surface right here, again putting a, a membrane, but now it's more like an open bathtub, and then floating, and, and so there's water on that, and for the designs that I built, it was, it was three to three and a half inches of water. And then on top of that, uh, uh, you know, four to eight inch layer of floating insulation. It doesn't have to float, but that's um, the easy thing to do if the insulation won't absorb uh, water and sink, which if you do it right, it won't. So, and now instead of uh, just, you know, trying to get a big panel system out of the way and radiating, now what you can do is spray that water with an irrigation spray head system up on top of the panels at night, and you get the combined effect of evaporative cooling and, and radiation. You lose a little water, but it's not a, a big penalty with this system because most of the, of the heat loss is via radiation, which doesn't lose any water. So you get all these droplets up there in the air, and they're all busy radiating heat to the sky. And um, so typically, we would have three inches of water did I do it again? No, it's working. I'm losing more time playing with this than if I just talked. Uh, we could get that three inches of water down to 55 degrees by, uh, on most summer mornings, even if it was 100 to 105 degrees the day before, because this is such a powerful cooling mechanism. And then on the simple systems like this, um, where you have no insulation between the, this uh, structural layer and the space below, you can just have passive cooling from that. And that's the way our last house worked that was out on Isle Royale here in Davis. Or you can have insulation there, and then whenever you want to, you can pump this cool water through radiant floors or fan coils to cool the building. And that's more controllable, so you can more precisely set, hit a temperature setting that you want to. So what's on the bottom here is uh, our demonstration project, which we built as the last stage of a funded project we had from the California Energy Commission to develop this cool, we called it cool roof then, but that term has been usurped by others now. Just means a white roof today, basically. But um, this was about a 6,300, this is a corner of about a 6,300 square foot um, array that we put on that building, and then we built a big fan coil down below to deliver the cooling. And, uh, that was, so then at the end of that project, we formed a company, Roof Science Corporation, uh, out of a business incubator that came out of Davis with some UC Davis involvement. And uh, that kind of moved around, but um, it was really, we hired a young MBA from UC Davis, and uh, it was really hard to sell that. People are, people are really risk averse in this industry, and having all that water sitting on their roof was not something they wanted. And we had decided, foolishly, at the beginning to be purists about this and only sell that water on the roof version. So uh, we subsequently developed a, what I'll call here version two, which has off-roof storage. This is one of the more successful projects we did. This is actually the roof of the all-weather manufacturing plant in Vacaville, which was finished in 1998, monitored for a couple of years, um, and has worked very well for all these years. It uh, was monitored by PG&E for a couple of years, demonstrated 87% peak demand reduction, 73% cooling energy reduction compared with the base case system. And it's all, what you're seeing here is just the, the roof spray system on the roof. Then there was a big uh, tank buried in the front yard of this building. Um, so, uh, you know, again, though, it, it turned out to be pretty hard to sell, and Roof Science Corporation, we got, I think, five of these installed with this off-roof storage approach before it kind of went on the, uh, on the shelf. The latest of these, though, that causes my current enthusiasm for it is this building in downtown Davis, where Carol and I live right now, this is Parkview Place, uh, 444 4th Street. Um, it's uh, owned by four couples, four senior couples. Um, and it demonstrates an integrated system, which I received, a, I received a patent on this concept last year, for the combination of night roof spray cooling with photovoltaic washing 
with rainwater collection. So we have an 11,000 gallon rainwater tank that is big enough to supply all the water that's needed for cooling, uh, covers all the losses from the night roof spray system through a season. Um, so I think, the, I think this synergistic combination of PV washing, uh, night roof spray cooling, and rainwater collection is, may have some legs, and I'm hopeful that it uh, can be successful in the future. Um, I went the wrong way again. You've seen that one. Uh, last thing I'm going to cover is dual cool. I have one more technology on here that I'm not going to cover unless we run out of questions, because I want to be sure to allow enough time for Q&A. But uh, dual cool is a concept that is, has been picked up by Integrated Comfort, which uh, is what grew out of, of um, Roof Science Corporation. It's been kept alive all these years, now being run by um, our son-in-law, Steve Short, who's here, Steve. And uh, Steve is largely responsible for the si significant success that we've had. I should also introduce uh, our, my grandson, Steve's son, Gavin, who uh, can't stop inventing himself already. Poor kid. He apparently has the, that dangerous gene. But uh, thanks for joining us today, Gavin. Um, anyway, dual cool was a concept that emerged in response to an opportunity uh, from the California electric utilities to reduce peak cooling demand. Uh, so, you know, uh, most of us at home, if we have air conditioning, most of us do now, especially in Davis, we have a, what's called a split system. There's a refrigerant based system that has an outdoor condensing unit, an indoor uh, fan coil, and refrigerant lines that connect the two. Um, but in commercial buildings, especially low rise commercial buildings, it's much more likely to be served by a, a packaged rooftop unit, which will basically be broken into two halves. And this is a, a representative of one of the, these. The, the left half here is where the unit discharges heat to the outdoors. It's the condenser side. It do, it's doing what the condensing unit at your home does. It's just uh, hot refrigerant gas is coming in there and it's discharging heat to the outdoors. Um, but uh, the, the indoor side is also packaged with this. Um, and it's at the right side here. And the reason that it's uh, so valuable to package these two together is that most of these commercial buildings are required by law to have some ventilation air brought in, to have some fresh air supplied. So um, that's, uh, the, the problem with rooftop units is the hotter it gets, the higher the price you pay efficiency-wise for it being so hot to dump heat at the condenser and it being so hot to bring fresh outdoor air in and cool it to uh, supply the required fresh air into the building. So what dual cool does is it adds an evaporative pre-cooling system that's very simple. It involves a, just an evaporative media pre-cooler that's here placed in front of the condensing coil. So that just direct adds humidity to the air that's being brought into the condenser. Who cares? You know, that, that condenser's performance is dependent on temperature, not humidity. So it's fine to do direct evaporative cooling there. And then well, what happens is that the water that's flowing down through this evaporative media is also being evaporatively cooled. So it's near the wet bulb temperature, which is in, on a summer day in Davis is unlikely to be as high as 70 degrees. So you get 70 degree water here that then we can pump through a water coil that's in the incoming airstream and cool that 100 degree air down to um, 80 to 85, which saves a lot of energy because then you don't have to cool it so far with the refrigerant uh, downstream of that. So that's the dual cool concept. Um, and we started, uh, we, got a, we earned the patent in 2003, but actually before that, uh, there were 900 tons or so installed under these um, Energy Commission programs in um, 2001, 2002, but since then, we've been lucky enough to tie up with Walmart, who's made a very considerable and s serious commitment to sustainability, and we've installed 36,000 tons of dual cool. That's a measure of cooling capacity since 2011, and um, more coming this year. So uh, the lesson on that one has really been, well, we've been lucky. We got into the right place at the right time. Um, but also, we've mostly been working with Walmart. There's huge potential with other customers. And there's a great opportunity in the zero net energy environment that we think is coming. 
GeoHelix is a ground heat exchanger system that we're working on aimed at residential and light commercial that I'm not going to talk about, but we have it at Parkview Place. And uh, these are some shots of how you can take these prepackaged um, slinky sort of things, expand them and drop them in a hole and bury them and make them into excellent earth heat exchangers. That thing on the left is a auger. Okay, so looking back, we have a joke in our family about the big one. There's a technology that I worked on with a with a, a with Shell Chemical back in the mid '80s, and and our teenage son Ben at that point, when I was talking about how promising this was at the table one night, said, "Dad, is this the big one?" <laughs> and so, ever since then, oh, it's been 30 years. We still joke about whether the big one is still coming. And maybe dual cool is it. It's, it's done pretty well. But uh, when I think about the big one, I realize I really probably should have, been, should have kept working at that electrical receptacle. And I have uh, a number of uh, technologies that I haven't described here that we developed with other people's money. My, my uh, synopsis said I was going to talk a little bit about working with other people's money. But as I look back at the things we did with it, I realized we really weren't quite as successful at, at successfully uh, making other people's money grow. Um, because somehow there's not as much pressure that way. And you know, there are other reasons, too. We hooked up with partners who were interested in seeing what we were doing, but they turned out not to be interested enough in really taking it to market. And so these are mostly technologies that were developed uh, under research contracts with uh, public funding agencies. Anyway, life is good. No regrets. Um, I think I'm just going to open it to questions now. Uh, you can read my conclusions, if you like. Um, I guess I have one little story to tell at the end, though, because, you know, I, I think you can, I hope you can pick up from what I'm saying that despite the huge design ego that the whole process I've gone through in my life over more than 50 years of this has been fairly humbling because so, so few of the things I've worked on have really made it successfully into the marketplace. But, um, and that, that, that last bullet that inventors tend to be manic depressive types, I think anyway, I don't really seriously consider myself to be one, but it is a lifestyle where you get very excited about the possibility for something, and then you become very deflated when you get rejected. And it's probably the same for authors and artists of all sorts. Um, but very, at various times in my career, people told me that I should get help. And usually they weren't talking about help with the technology I'm working on, I think. <laughs> no, I don't know. But I have a little get help story to tell because my college roommate who uh, became CFO later of one of the major oil companies, and so he was on a success path. He, when he was hired, just before he was hired, he had an interview which led to his being hired, and in the interview they asked him to imagine that he was in a, in a room by himself and he had a very important task to accomplish which involved connecting two strings which were beyond his reach. He could reach one, he could reach the other, he couldn't reach them both at the same time. What would he do? And you know, when my engineer mind heard the question, of course, I started thinking about all things, things I could do with harmonics to get one swinging toward me and the other one swinging toward me. And then the correct answer was, go outside and get help. They didn't tell him he couldn't try to find, find somebody to come in and help him with this task. And that's what they wanted to hear. And it's what he said, and he got the job. <laughs> so. Um, Working with other people makes everything more fun. Multiple minds are better than one. Don't try to hole up when you're working on a design and think you have all the answers. And that's maybe the most important lesson I've learned. And now there's no time for questions. No, I'm happy to stay as long as people like. Oh, I thought we had only 50, so. Uh, sorry, well, oh yeah, you're right. <laughs> you know, I've been speeding through this and I did allow 10 minutes for questions. And I have time to go back and talk more about GeoHelix if everyone is asleep and wants to be droned at some more. <laughs> okay, I'll go back. <laughs> And if there are any of those others that, you know, I just went by too fast because I wanted to get to questions, um, I can go back and add, uh, you know, add some detail on those. But so um, right now, the way most of our buildings in California are heated is with gas. 
and then cooling is always by electric. But both space heating and water heating are with gas. And uh, we're committed as a society in California to get to net zero uh, for all our buildings by 2050 and to get to net zero for new buildings, residential by 2020 and commercial by 2030, or non-residential. I shouldn't just say commercial because it gives you all non-residential by 2030. Well, <clears throat> those, those targets are going to push back because there's going to be so much, there is already so much resistance. But they're valid targets. If we want to get to uh, zero carbon by 2050, we probably have to um, go all electric. So what's the most efficient way to use electricity to heat space and water for our residences and uh, space for buildings that don't need water heating? Well, it's with a heat pump. And the most efficient heat pumps, the problem with heat pumps is they're the least efficient when you need them the most. How many of you know a little bit about the thermodynamic cycle and how heat pumps work? So most, okay, good. So, so you know that you know, the lift that the heat pump is working across is, uh, is directly uh, influen influencing its efficiency. The larger that lift, the lower the, the efficiency. So if you're trying to heat uh, something to a hotter temperature or if you're trying to extract heat from a colder source, then you're going to pay the price. But when do you need cooling the most? When it's hottest and you're trying to discharge heat into a very hot environment. When do you need heat the most? When it's coolest, that's when you're trying to extract heat and uh, you need it most when it's coldest outdoors. Bad formula. So if you can bury some heat exchanger in the ground, um, you can moderate that, uh, that challenge and have the most efficient heating system available. And there's been lots of successful implementation of ground-coupled heat pumps in more severe climates, typically the Midwest and the upper US. But not so much in California, because our climate is so mild that, and gas has been so cheap and electricity is so expensive, it's a triple whammy, that um, heat pumps haven't done so well. They had, they had a pretty strong growth curve for air source heat pumps in the 70s and early 80s, but the electric utilities kind of stopped pushing them because gas was cheaper for people to operate. Um, but now, looking at a net zero environment, it really flips that equation. And, but to get very dense sourcing from the ground, you, pro you pretty much have to go vertical unless you're way out in the country. So the way people have been installing these uh, ground-coupled heat pumps is with deep bores. They're like water well drilling technologies. And you go down 150 to 200 feet, and then you put a U-tube in at that depth, and you grout it full, and it's very expensive, way too expensive for California. So at Davis Energy Group, uh, we had a contract in the late 90s to evaluate the opportunity for geo-exchange heating in California. and uh, we found some decent applications, a few, and we came up with this concept of a, sh of a sh relatively shallow helix that could be installed quickly and inexpensively. And uh, that went on the shelf for a long time. We kind of resurrected it when we built our Parkview Place project, and Integrated Comfort has taken it on as a, as a possible technology to broaden our, our product scope beyond dual cool. So what this is is a... What we're working on is a 22-inch diameter helix that you can wind and pack flat, ship a long distance if necessary in a box, and then stretch out at the site and put into a pre-augured hole and then backfill around it um, and uh, connect a bunch of these up in parallel to get the required amount of heat exchanger. Um, multiples in parallel is required for the heat pump capacity. And uh, this is just a little bit of look at uh, our project. These were the coils ready to install. These were the targets where the auger was going to hit and drill the holes. These are on the south side. We put, um, put them on both the south and east sides of the project. Uh, by the way, um, there's a Western Cooling Efficiency Center project. By the way, Mark Madera, who's um, director of the WCEC, is here. Thanks for coming, Mark. Um, they have a project to optimize the design of the geohelix. Um, and, you know, we, we see a, a big growth potential. I've got one more slide that just shows some photos of how this is done. This is one of the augers. Um, to, and we, these typically go down 22 feet. <clears throat> so it's a 20-foot tall 
coil when it's extended and two foot of cover of earth cover on top so you auger to 22 feet or more if you want more cover on it and then um, this is one of the uh, helix is kind of this big floppy thing because it's held together with uh, some half inch PVC tube that's strong enough to hold it together while you're uh, getting it ready to dump in the hole and then it's strong enough held together strong enough so that you can backfill around it with some uh, techniques that we've learned that here it is going into the hole and then you connect a bunch of these in uh, this is a they, they're spaced nine to ten feet apart and then connect them with a trench and the manifold piping goes into this trench. You can see the next one here, the next one is down here, next one down here and so on. So you, then you connect them all together as I said in parallel plumbing configuration and away you go. Question? Uh, I've always contemplated uh, what's going to happen in the case of leakage? Well um, that's, you know, you're going to have to repair it. Um, the, the, there's been a lot of work done, though, with these high-density polyethylene tubing uh, uh, products, and the folks who are manufacturing and selling that tubing for placement in the ground are giving 50 to 55-year warranties on them in the ground. So um, they're really they're really tough. But yeah, if, uh, and you know, if you if you're the, something near the surface, you could repair something deep. You couldn't. You'd have to just um, choke that one off and uh, have some extra or add another one somehow. Right. So if it's fairly deep enough, you know, they, they, they don't dig it out and uh, actually fix it. It's, the cost is not... Uh, right, yeah. I mean, we're, doing, we're doing some work and thinking on the possibility of immersing these in, in water bags to the 22-foot depth and then putting a cap on it. And that's a configuration that would allow access and, and service mm -hmm. later. And the water surrounding it, if you can keep it there, that's the challenge, um, improves performance because you have better, more conductivity and free convection and all that. Yeah. Uh, the the uh, well, of course, it depends on the temperatures and what happens. I mean, the trick is to have the right amount of heat exchanger in the ground. You can put a whole bunch in there, and then let's take winter, for example. You might start with the water coming back from the ground at, in, in this climate at 65 degrees or even higher if you've been discharging heat in the summer. You get that back, and that's one of the benefits. And then as you get deeper and deeper into the heating season, you're going to be dragging that return water temperature down because you're pumping even cooler water in that's gone through the heat pump. The heat pump's taking heat out of that water, cooling it, sending it into the ground. Um, so if you have a lot of heat exchanger, you won't drop the temperature as far, but you'll spend more. It's an optimization problem. You'll spend more on the array of, of heat exchanger in the ground to get that better performance. So that's why the, the cooling center project is exciting for us is because they're developing a computer model with a ground heat exchange uh, component to it that will really help us run some economic studies and determine uh, what's, what's optimal. It's going to vary by climate, too. And of course, it's going to vary a little bit by year. So we have to work with an average weather year. So you know, it's a, it's a, it's a fun engineering uh, problem and question that you ask. And we're, we don't have the answer yet, for sure. Okay, let's give him one last round of applause. And thanks, thanks, Jason, for the pointer that I was so so uniquely <laughs> ill prepared to use. No, I should have told you that it's finicky. Yeah, you have to press it again. Yeah, and I didn't. I thought it would stay on once I held it. But okay, I better turn this off. Yeah. Okay, maybe I hold, to hold in like my bike bike.